of coffee a little more interesting. What do you think makes a cup of coffee a little more interesting? So that we actually end up, you know, spending 150, 200 bucks on a cup of coffee. Right? So are we paying for the coffee? We pay for the experience of coffee, right? Of drinking coffee in that ambience. And uh, who pioneered this? Starbucks. So um, the whole coffee drinking experience is taken to a completely different level, right? It's not about that cup of coffee anymore, but so many things that they're doing around that cup of coffee. So whether it is, you know, creating your own beverages through a mobile device, their uh, awesome loyalty management experience, uh, things like, you know, gift a coffee. Does anybody know what that gift a coffee thing is? Every time you have a cup of coffee, you can actually, you know, just donate something so that some homeless person or some poor person can get a free cup of coffee on your behalf. Right? So all these things, they have woven this entire story around a cup of coffee to make that coffee drinking memorable and we don't mind spending a small fortune for it. When we talk about magical experiences, can Disneyland be far behind? So, um, where is the magic of Disneyland? In the rides? Yes, no? Right. Yes. Yeah. In the rides, yes, but think about it. Thousands of people are going on these roller coasters. You think nobody throws up? <laughs> but I've not heard anybody complain about dirt in Disneyland. It's a clockwork-like decision to manage the entire experience and make sure that when you come out, you're coming out with a very nice memory. So they have things like, you know, helping you locate where you've parked the car. The parking lots are like huge, right? So they don't want you to come out with this memory that shucks, I couldn't find my car, you know, at the end of a fabulous day. Or they have something called as like these memory maker RFID things that they're going to introduce for kids in the bands so that when, uh, you know, the kids pass by their favorite characters, the characters can actually call them out by names. How cool is that? Right? My favorite. How many theater fans here? Yes, yes. I guess there is competition, but uh, so when I came for this trip, uh, this was sponsored by my office, and obviously they didn't go through clear trip. So every moment I was really missing those small, small things, like you know, sending me the notifications in advance a week before on my mobile, sending me those uh, digitized boarding passes on my mobile. I have to actually hunt for the paperwork, and I'm not so I'm not used to it anymore. You know, thanks to clear trip, it's really spoiled me. Kindle. I never thought I will become an e-reader convert, but with the Kindle now, it's so ergonomic, it's so light, it's just like, you know, reading a book and even better. Actually, uh, this trip, after a very long time, I picked up a paper book from my office to read. I'm reading uh, Freakonomics. And I'm like, can't I zoom this font? It's so <laughs> tiny. So, okay. So what makes these experiences stand out. We all design awesome online experiences, right? But when the online experience doesn't compare with its offline counterpart, you have a gap. When you're using something online, you expect all the services around it to be awesome. When I'm using an awesome clear trip, I expect the moment I call the customer service desk, they should not take me through that huge IVRS. Because they are all about simplicity. So, as designers, we need to ensure that the experiences that we are designing so painstakingly in the online world need to reflect in the offline world as well. And so, you Can these guys see me? You can use the speaker over there. It's okay. I think, can, can you hear me at the back of the room, yeah, guys? Yes, yeah. yes. So, now, designing customer experiences. So, over, I think, some of the talks yesterday, I heard a few speakers comment on this, that we use the words usability and user experiences to my mind, usability today is you know, what we used to do in the 90s, the usability engineering part, but today is more of hygiene. Do you have exits from every page? Do you have a way to go back? Do you have a way to go forward? The accessibility. 
usability. But beyond that, what is your brand about? Right? Taking that into consideration to craft the UI, that's user experience. How many people in this room consider themselves as usability designers who don't do user experience? Anybody? None. How many user experience designers in this room? Okay, quite many. Now, beyond user experience, what? So, so far we've been designing for our users. Customer is a bad <laughs> word, right? But uh, consider the classic analogy of uh, when you design a toy. You design for who? Your user, who's the kid, and the buyer, who's the parent. So for the kid, you design the features, the functionalities, the squeaky voices. Yeah. For the parent, you design the affordability, the form factor, no sharp edges, non-toxicity. So you're actually catering to both. Right. So why confine ourselves only to think from a user perspective? Why not broaden our sphere? Because I come from a products world, I'm going to talk about customer experience life cycle in context of products. This is actually taken from a book called Customer Experience Edge. So guys, I'm just looking it up. So typically, when you're talking about a customer's life cycle with respect to a product, you're talking about identify, I have a problem, I need to identify a solution. So I'll go to search engines, I'll go to blogs. I'll try to figure out what are the tools or the utilities that can suffice my need. Then I will look at what are the different options. So I will evaluate, you know, the sandbox environment, the literature. Then I will decide what I want to buy and actually go through the whole buying process. So the procurement, the licensing, the contract. Then if the deploy part, this is typically for software products where you will have your installation, you have your initial training. Then you have use, which is the standard task, and the troubleshooting, the support. Now, if across all of this, <coughs> your experience is good, what will happen? You will re-engage. Otherwise, you leave. Re-engage is you either buy another product from the same vendor, or you go for an update of the same. Now, each of these milestones, identify, evaluate, procure, deploy, just think about it. You know, from the moment I identify a need and I start looking for a product to actually evaluating what are my options. I go through hundreds and thousands of interactions, right? I may go to different blogs, I may talk to people, I may look for things on websites. So each of these are called touch points. Okay? And it's the series of touch points that actually make your whole customer experience journey. With me so far, everybody? Yes. Don't sleep. <laughs> of eveggies.com or uh, let's say a you know, virtual uh, online company which uh, sells vegetables. So I have a person, a Sonia, who visits the site. She's happy with the broad choice. So she has a big smile. Um, she thinks it's expensive as compared to the, you know, the local vendor, but it's okay. It's from the comfort of her house, so she doesn't mind. So she goes ahead and orders online. After she orders, she realizes the cash on delivery option is not there. Now, cash on delivery is something that most of the Indian sites are offering. So she assumes it's there and she's really annoyed. For some reason, she doesn't want to use a credit card to buy vegetables. Okay. Her moment of delight comes when the vegetables are actually delivered in two hours. And then she has the next question that okay, next time can I order some more? Consider this as an example of a customer experience price cycle. Now, you guys tell me, okay? There are some points of obvious happiness here and some points of obvious frustration, right? Obvious happiness is, you know, you heard where she is like beaming and you where she is like really happy. And this is the frustration part. Now, if I were to make a product, okay? How would I want to design this overall interaction? Do I want her to have this expression throughout? How many yes? How many no? And the others are maybe? <laughs> okay. So, what customer experience tells us? Designing every interaction across your customer experience life cycle to be awesome is not sustainable. You will peak out very soon. Okay? Or you will be investing so much money into it that you will run out. Maximum impact for the customer, maximum reach.
call value and maximum differentiation for you as a company. I am doing something unique that my competitor is not doing. For example, let's say uh, an airline is delayed and then it just gives you free visa. How awesome is that? And that is going to stay with the traveler for a very, very long time. These are for moments of growth. Remember this word because whether you like it or not, this is something that you will end up doing in the next two to three years. Using these terms. So, how much can the CX from user experience? Tell me if this sounds familiar. Anybody? What is this? of our user-centered design process, now encompassing customer experience. Okay, now look at it again with that context. So how do you define a CX strategy? You have business goals, you have user studies, you have customer pain points, you have user pain points. My product may be very good for a user to use, but for them to onboard, you know, get it installed, it's a headache. So as user experience designers, we may Maybe not concern ourselves with that, but as customer experience designers, it does become our problem. Then you have experience design. So there are various ways you do experience design. So you have customer experience journey maps. I think we saw a few of them in the workshops. Um, then there are methodologies like root cause analysis, five wives to identify you know where the pain points are there. Defining what you want to be your moments of growth. You use all that as a basis for design. Then you prototype, you test, you monitor and you item. Okay, let's talk about a little bit in detail about each of these. When you talk about CX strategy, it is about taking your tagline seriously. How many of you all have companies which have taglines? Mind us, experience certainty. Okay, so we are going to play a quick game here. Can any, everybody read? It's a lead fresh. You know who this is? Very good. The world in time. Excellent. A to Z. It's everywhere you want to be. Just down. Okay, visa. She will start showing me the platter. Expect more, pay less.
seen. So there are certain things that we, remember we are looking at it from Anita's perspective, right? So there are things behind the scene that she doesn't know, but they're still happening. And we need to document that when you create the CH1. So Anita logs to the company uh, internet. So the artifact here, so this color, the goldenish brown, is the artifact that she's interacting with. She finally links to log, log the ticket, logs the ticket, receives confirmation, the application she's interacting with is the ticketing application. Behind the scenes, what is happening? The request is going into the infra pool. Um, infrastructure pool. It's allocated to a person called Ashok. So I executed for Ashok. Now, two days later, it is still not updated. Hmm. Ashok is busy with another issue and next day he's on leave. She doesn't have any updates. She escalates to the infra manager. The, the medium is email, phone. It is then manually assigned to Manu as a priority request because it's gone, escalated, so you know, fix it in two hours. Right? Uh, Manu contacts Manita, installation is completed and ticket is closed. Okay. Now if we look at this journey map, there are three states here. At some point she's going to be happy, slightly perturbed and downright unhappy. So what we do as the next step is, we stick these dots. So if you are doing it physically in a poster, you can use you know, different colored bindis or something. So you stick these dots on where you think the uh, mode applies the most. So green, 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 orange, red, blue, green. Okay. Now this will help you actually detail down to where the problem is. So the problem is no updates and escalates to instrument. Now think about what you can do differently. So can the system itself find out that you know the SLE suppose is 3 hours or 4 hours. So after that it automatically assigns the request to somebody else so that this entire thing could have been avoided. At the same time because 4 hours are already lost, maybe an email can go to um, Anita saying that look for some reason we are delayed. She is um, upset not only because the problem has not been fixed but because she has not been communicated. Until she you know escalates the matter she doesn't get any communication. So fine, don't fix the problem but if you communicate what is wrong. Of how you do experience design, there are of course various other techniques. Uh, idea is you have the toolkit to do it. Then we have monitoring. So, how do you monitor whether the solutions that you have defined as a part of your customer experience are working or not? So, you have observation metric, perception metric, and outcome metric. These are pretty much industry standard. What do you mean by observation metric is what is actually captured through your web analytics or your CRM tool. Time spent on a page, average call time, ticket raised. Perception metric, how customers perceive your product or services. So yesterday, those who attended, I think Sarah's workshop could have talked about net promoter score. For those of you, anybody who doesn't know what net promoter score is? Okay. So net promoter score is where you basically ask people to rate your product or your service on a scale of 0 to 10. How likely are you to recommend this product or service to friend or colleague? <coughs> and um, depending on the score, uh, they calculate an average and that is considered to be how likely people are overall likely to um, recommend your product. So a high NPS means that your product is doing good and a low means of course you need to, you need to work on it. Um, then there is the outcome metric. Outcome metric is what you actually see in terms of tangible results. So what was your churn rate? Has your wallet share increased or not? Has uh, has the number of footfalls you know, to your website increased or not? So things you would typically calculate over a period of time. Okay. Um, this is an example of a customer experience assessment that we didn't use yet. So um, my group, which is actually the product experience COE, has uh, you know four different streams. User experience, customer experience, uh, information visualization, and product help and support, so the product documentation. Uh, UX and CX, both of them I had, and under the CX initiative, we did this particular exercise where we have a suite of products called Mastercraft. It's uh, basically productive, like productivity accelerators, like you know, HP Quality Center kind of products. And all that. So uh, we went and spoke to the people who use these products as well. 
three colored cards. The blue are issues cited by customer. Green by the IC Connect for the PRM kind of people. And the maroons are uh, those cited by the product pre-sales guys. You know, people within the product teams who typically do demos and stuff like that. We evaluated the quality of experience through one-on-one -on -one telephonic and face-to-face -face interviews across discovery, evaluate, buy, access, use and support. All those product touch points that we saw earlier. Interesting things that we saw here was, if you look at this, right? Use and support. Quite a few customer issues are cited here. But when we asked the BRM guys and the product resales, so do you think customers are having any issues here? Not a single one. Yeah? Because typically for them what happens is once the sale is made, they will probably not bother about what are the, what are the other issues that customers are facing. With. Whereas for them, maximum issues were in discovery and evaluate. You know, I think customers have a genuine fi uh, problem finding my product. Customers are saying, no, no, when we want it, we know who to ask. But since the, these guys, they need to sell and they feel that sales is not happening enough because awareness is not enough, they assumed these things. You know, so you have to be very careful when you're talking to users and proxy users. The findings can be very revealing. So, we are kind of towards the end now. I know. <laughs>